That's one of the things that's really important to know when we wander into psychological disorders in chapter 12 or those sorts of things. Everybody deals with some sort of life challenge from time to time. That does not constitute a disorder. It just simply means that, you know what, the struggle is real. So to look at normal versus abnormal, we're going to first of all examine behavior. And again, culture dictates whether or not whatever behavior happens to be normal or appropriate. Is somebody's behavior what we might consider to be bizarre? Is it harmful in some way, not only to the individual, but perhaps to other people? Is, does it create some sort of dysfunction? Is there something odd that has provoked such a behavior? All those sorts of questions come into play when we're looking at abnormal versus normal. What about the consequence of the behavior? Again, another factor that plays into the equation. At the end of the day, abnormal boils down to being something that goes against what culture says is appropriate likely is dysfunctional in some way, and at the same time creates a level of impaired functioning. In other words, something is just not quite right. And as a result of that, people typically end up with some kind of disorder. One of the fun elements that becomes an exception to the rule is to remember that just because it's a disorder over here in westernized United States, America, doesn't mean that such a behavior is a disorder in Africa. It does not mean that it's a a behavioral concern is a disorder in, on any other part of the planet. Again, those ideas are culturally specific. It's important to be mindful that as a, as a fact that because those realities are a little bit different variations on culture is that not everybody considers those concerns to be abnormal or dysfunctional or even disorder worthy in any sort of way. So, if you want to start trying to explain how people end up with psychological disorders, we'll start with the biopsychosocial model. The biopsychosocial model looks at abnormalities of behavior as caused by difficulties in the interaction of biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors. In other words, Biopsychosocial models suggest that whatever disorder or challenge we're dealing with is a combination of physical issues, emotional issues, and cultural concerns. Seems reasonable, but from a biological perspective, uh, let's go back and look at our friend uh, Hippocrates, a Greek physician who introduced the medical model. He suggested that um, Psychological disorders resulted from imbalances among the four humors. Now, what he defined as a humor, um, looked at those ideas as in a medical model, involved the concept of mental illness. Now we call it neurobiological challenges. Psychologically speaking, mental disorders are caused by some kind of internal turmoil, usually related to some other type of psychological event. Psychological models are psychodynamic, cognitive and social or humanistic. Socio-cultural contexts deals with factors such as gender and age. Please don't forget, sex, as in male or female, is different than gender. Culture decides what is gender. Cultural values and expectations, history in general, cultural and general disorders appear in most societies while culture specific forms appear only in certain cultures or in certain areas. Another particular model is what we call the diathesis stress model. It looks at genetics, our early learning, biological processes, as well as stress levels and how all of those work together to perhaps contribute to psychological concerns. So, just for fun, at the end of the day, you get to decide, first of all, what you think is quote-unquote normal when compared to abnormal. What you consider to be normal or abnormal may not be the same thing for me, and that's okay. What I consider to be abnormal might not be abnormal for you, and again, that's okay. At the end of the day, 
one of the bigger challenges that we deal with when it comes to diagnosing such concerns is to what extent is the person under duress? Is the difficulty or the normality or the abnormality creating some kind of extra distress or dysfunction in life that keeps them from doing their very best? You know, I know of lots of individuals who count things there was a time in life when I would be sitting in class and would count ceiling tiles. Okay, I was bored. No worries. Does that mean that I'm obsessive and compulsive? The only way that my counting of tiles would be obsessive or compulsive is if it messes with my general function in other areas of my life. It does not. I probably mentioned this before. At my house, there are 15 stairs that go from the first floor to the second floor of my home. And you know what? There's 15 steps that come down from the second floor of my house to the first floor. You know what? There's 15 going up and 15 coming down every single time. How do I know this? Because I count them every single time. Am I obsessive? Am I OCD? Not at all. I just count steps. I can tell you how wide these hallways are over here at Century City because I count uh, the number of tiles on the floor. The tiles on the floor are typically 12 inch square. Count them, that gives you a rough idea of how wide the hall is. Just take a glance when you're walking by there and you can find out exactly how wide the hallway is. No worries. Does that mean that I'm deformed or odd or abnormal? Some people would say, well, yes, Dr. Hamilton, you very well are very abnormal in counting such things. Why would you bother? My response to that would be, why don't you try it sometime? Again, it's not about what you think is most appropriate per se, it's what's causing distress for individuals. And counting floor tiles or looking at a ceiling tile doesn't create distress for me, not in any way. I've even been known to count the number of steps it takes to get from one place to another. But I get bored after a certain handful of steps and quit counting, not that important. But again, does that do I count things like that because I have some gene abnormality in the gene pool? No, I just count. Not a worry. Do I fold clothes a certain way? Yes. Have I folded clothes the exact same way for extended numbers of years? Yes. Am I OCD? Nope. I just like things to be a certain way. Okay. Again, it's about to what extent those concerns create distress or dysfunction. I've known people who write lists. I'm sure many of you write lists. Okay, good for you. Now, does writing that list and having to check off boxes on that list keep you from doing your laundry? If it does, that's a problem. Does it keep you from cooking your dinner? If it does, that's a concern. Does it keep you from relating well with your significant other? If keeping up with that list and checking off a box limits your ability to do that, it's a problem. So again, it depends on to what extent a person is under stress or under a number of, I'm sorry. It depends on how much stress a person is under versus the amount of dysfunction the abnormality creates. Now your book is going to refer to um, the DSM-4, unless I am mistaken. The DSM-4 TR, which stands for text revision, is no longer in use. The DSM-4 TR stopped being used in 2013. We currently use DSM-5. Some of those diagnostic criterion that are listed in the DSM-5 differ somewhat from the DSM-4. Certain things evolve and we deal with certain types of disorders in a different way. Um, but as the book speaks to the notion of the DSM-4, we diagnosed things using a different sort of table. We used what was called um, diagnostic axes. In other words, there were a handful of axes that we used to define certain behaviors. Axis one were personality disorders. I'm sorry, they were cognitive and or emotional disorders. Axis two was personality concerns. Axis three was information that was medically inclined and typically was deferred to medical physicians and axis four escapes me off the top of my head, and axis five was what we call a GAF, a GAF, a Global Assessment of Function. And when a person's global, when a person's GAF score 
drop below 50 on a scale of one to 100, it was possible that we would be looking at hospitalization for such people. Um, I've never had anybody put in a hospital at any time, even though a gap was extensively below 50. Um, sometimes people just don't do well and the numbers are rather low. Again, those axes two dealt with personality disorders and including mental retardation. Axis three was physical issues. Axis four, now it's li listed in my notes, um, deals with outside stressors. A person who's a victim of sexual assault, for example, that notation would go into axis four. Axis five, again, is related to that level of function. We don't use those categories anymore. We just stick a diagnosis there. When it comes time to offer a diagnosis, if there is one, we just stick the diagnosis at the bottom of the document. Now, the fun part with diagnostic criteria is to what extent those things are biased. I'm going to assume, which I know is dangerous, that most of us understand what it, a bias is. Being biased is to automatically think in one particular perspective to the exclusion of other possible perspectives. A good example might be, um, Certainly in today's contemporary culture in our political environment, we could have a conversation about how black lives matter. Some people view that in one particular vein of thought. Other individuals view that notion of that sort of discussion in a completely different vein of thought. Those differences are going to involve some level of bias, meaning I am prone to think of things in a specific way based on how I was raised, in essence. There are a number of different kinds of biases, like a confirmation bias, people who are doing research. We have a tendency when we're doing research to find what we're looking for. You know why? Because we're not watching for something else. And if we're not watching for something else, well, it's possible that we'd make a poor choice, a poor decision when it comes to the research. Bias, is, is, that's a, one way to look at bias is that we see what we're looking to see. There, are, which also means the opposite is true, that we can create a bias when we refuse to see things that are blatantly obvious, those sorts of ideas. The DSM-4 had larger quantities, I guess you could say, of what we would consider to be, quote unquote, um, diagnostic difficulties. As an example, you could go back to, the, I think it's the DSM-3. It's either the DSM-2 or the DSM-3 listed homosexuality as a psychological disorder. That's, I mean, that's just for your own personal reference. But up until a certain period of time, anything that pushed against the cultural standard of normal was considered a psychological disorder. That has long since been removed from the DSM altogether. And DSM, by the way, stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, the current copy is purple. You can go to your local library and probably find one in the reference section. There are copies of it here in the Century City Library paperback. And I'm sure there's at least one or two copies over in Vernon at their library, if you want to look up something from a diagnostic perspective. Um, each particular disorder has a list of things that are necessary to qualify. So the diagnostic system, if we're not careful, becomes very biased. When we're looking at how we're going to diagnose things, I probably have mentioned things like this before. If an Anglo person walks into my office and begins to tell me about their deceased auntie coming to check in on them in the middle of the night because they're fearful or whatever else, I'm probably going to make a note. But depending on the person, an individual who's African-American who comes into my office and tells me that their auntie comes to check on them in the middle of the night, that may not be as big a deal. It is not as abnormal in some African-American spheres of, of communicating. That's normal. I've had numerous African-American women come into my office and speak with me about the fact that they have deceased relatives who come and visit them all the time. They come and check on them just to make sure things are going well. Again, for some of us, that sounds absolutely bonkers. That's probably because some of us are biased. 
one way to look at the notion of bias and how we diagnose things is in all fairness, as rude as it may sound, and y'all know that I'm not always known for being politically correct. How do you identify your ethnicity? Are you white? Are you Caucasian? Are you Anglo? Are those three the same? Depends on who you ask. Do you consider yourself to be black, African-American, Negro? Are those the same? Did you come from Africa? If you didn't come from Africa, are you an African-American? It's a question that some people discuss on a consistent basis. I tend to defer. I always, in fact, when I'm doing evaluations, defer to what that person tells me. When I am curious, I will ask, how do you identify your ethnicity? Are you Mexican or are you Latino? If you come from Mexico, you are not Spanish. People who are Spanish come from Spain. People from Mexico are either Mexican, Latino, or some other derivative but they are not Spanish. They may speak Spanish, but not necessarily in the classical sense, like individuals might who come from Spain. Again, as an example, all of those sorts of ideas come into play when we're dealing with psychological disorders. When we're doing research related to those psychological disorders, the individuals gathering data must account for the fact that there may be bias in their research. So when you're dealing with whatever folks consider to be psychological disorders, you have to decide what's normal for you, and what's abnormal. You've got to do something really, really, and I mean really strange to get my attention to the point that I'm going to say, hey, we need to have a conversation. Individuals come into my office on a consistent basis with all kinds of challenges from uh, being terribly depressed because they've uh, miscarried children to PTSD because their children have been murdered. Um, military people who deal with PTSD because they've dealt with the, their own threat of life or killed other people, all kinds of things related to evaluations. None of that's abnormal for me in my world. I deal with that on a consistent basis. Now, if you folks automatically walk into somebody's office and y'all are dealing with individuals who have all these different sorts of challenges, you're gonna go, what the heck? My challenge is to make sure that I give ample consideration to the difficulty and not poo-poo it away. Does someone's grief, which is defined in the DSM-5 anyway as bereavement, has that moved from being significant grief into a major depressive episode? What's the difference? It's important for me to know what the difference is. Part of that has to do with time. Lots of people tell me that they have bipolar issues. I love that diagnosis, but what a lot of people don't realize is that what they call bipolar disorder is just a crappy attitude. That's not the same thing. Well, my mood changes a lot, so what? Maybe you're just a difficult, grumpy person. It's important for me to know as a clinician what the difference is, how to find out what I need to know, all of that sort of stuff. You know, and simply because somebody tells me, you know, I could coach you on what to tell a person who's assessing you what that person needs to hear to get you whatever diagnosis you want. That's easy. You just have to look it up and know how to report the symptoms. But I promise you, if you walk into my office and quote me the criterion related to certain disorders, as in like you're reading it to me out of a book, you and I are going to have a whole lot longer conversation. Because I will ask you different ways to get to the same sort of information trying to determine if that's an actual issue or not. There are disorders that come into play that involve the literal and intentional falsification of information for what we call an external gain. I play like I have a disorder so that I can get a check. What that translates into, 
I've visited with lots of parents who will tell me their children have all kinds of attentional issues so they can get a, a check based on ADHD. It's really uncomfortable when I get to look at a parent and say, I'm sorry, little Johnny doesn't meet the criteria for ADHD. Let's talk about how it is you parent. Sometimes kids are just misbehaved because they're not parented well. That does not mean that little Bessie has ADHD. Does it mean that she does not? It doesn't mean she does. doesn't mean that she does not necessarily. You have to know what you're looking for. And simply because somebody says I have XYZ issue doesn't necessarily make it so. Considering what it happens to be reasonable, those are fun. Reasonableness is always a great discussion. Is your challenge reasonable? Again, my challenge as a clinician is to be sure that I'm not overly biased against providing a, a diagnosis because sometimes there really are legitimate concerns there. So let's start in general with anxiety concerns. How many of you, now I know that you would ask, answer me differently if you were in the room. So just for the sake of argument, if you were in the room and you were gonna raise your hand, how many of you would say that you deal with a, what you might define for yourself as a significant level of anxiety? You're just nervous. Sometimes people get, how many of you get more nervous or more anxious when it's time to take a test? Lots of people do. Do y'all have generalized anxiety disorder? Would you automatically assume that you do? No, there's a list of criteria for that. And it's, I'm, I have horrible test anxiety. I promise you, I am not diagnosable as having generalized anxiety disorder. If anything, you're gonna diagnose me as having a bad attitude. If there was a diagnostic criteria for a bad attitude, I would meet that every day of the week because my attitude can be really poor and I'll own that. But anxiety disorders as a whole involve strong, keyword here, irrational fear of a particular object or a situation that should not prompt such an adverse reaction. Now that's the clinical way to put it. In other words, you get twisted up in a knot over something that for other people is not that big a deal. Talk to my wife about snakes. If she ever found a snake in our home, she would burn it to the ground or at least threaten to. She does not do snakes. She doesn't want to look at a snake on television. She doesn't want to think about a snake. Even if she sees one crawl across the TV screen, she's going to wiggle and it's like, Ew, yuck. Snakes don't bother me that badly. But I can say that if I'm aware of a snake, I'm a little more vigilant, we'll say. Certainly trying to figure out if the snake is poisonous or not. How many of you are afraid of heights? You know, lots of folks who are afraid of being high up on something. I knew a guy who didn't like to drive across overpasses in, da in Dallas and Fort Worth because they were too stinking tall. He'd get sick. And he did not drive, and he was just a passenger. He didn't drive anyway. His wife was driving. But he didn't like to go up. There's a big overpass over on I-30, over toward just uh, Garland and Mesquite that veers off to go toward Greenville to the east. Um, that overpass is tall. It is a monster. And if you get distracted looking over the side of that overpass while you're trying to drive across it, you're liable to have an accident because it can be very disorienting. Some of y'all might get a little twisted up when you get when you hit the flyover here in Wichita Falls. I don't know. Some people get anxious over the flyover. All kinds of things can be problematic. Some people are afraid. Uh, how many of you are afraid of clowns? I've forgotten the word for it, but it, there's, there's a disorder for that. Um, how many of you are afraid you're gonna make a mistake, speak inappropriately? We all have those sorts of anxieties. Sometimes we get anxious to the point that we're going to, we think we're going to embarrass ourselves in public. How many of you do better if you go to the store with a, a trusted companion, someone that you trust implicitly that helps you feel safe? Some, I know 
lots of people who go to Walmart who walk in there and are afraid they cannot get out. Walmart, literally the walls at Walmart start to close in on them. They will leave a full buggy in a check stand and hit the door if their anxiety level gets too big. That's problematic. That's something that's diagnosable. Now, the definition of a disorder called agoraphobia is the strong fear of being separated from a safe place like being at your house, which is why if you can go somewhere with a trusted companion, that's a little more along the line of agoraphobia versus social anxiety. Social anxiety is more about being uh, feeling like you're going to embarrass yourself. Those are different. Generalized anxiety is a lesser degree of anxiety over a longer period of time. Generalized anxiety disorder has to have been present for at least six months. That's different from panic disorder, which is an acute, highly intense level of anxiety that peaks in a hurry and then begins to subside over a smaller amount of time. That's different from generalized anxiety disorder, which doesn't get as intense, but lasts longer. Those sorts of ideas. Sometimes people have what we call free floating anxiety and it describes to, it simply describes a level of anxiety that is consistent and constant with such people. Does it mean that that person has a disorder? Not necessarily. Just so you know, obsessive compulsive disorder or it's also known as OCD concerns is classified as an anxiety disorder. Now, I know you're not gonna answer me because all of you online anyway have all of your microphones muted. Um, but if you were in the classroom, I would be curious as to what you would say as in why you think OCD is anxiety related. How many of you have your, either yourself or people you know who have every little thing, every little doodad, every little knickknack has its own specific place in your home. And if somebody nudges it, you will know. I know a lot of people who have challenges like that. Does that mean that you have OCD? Nope. Now, if you're worried about making sure that that particular gadget's in the right place to the point that you forget to cook dinner for your children, that's a problem. How many of you vacuum? This is a good one. How many of you vacuum, but when you vacuum yourself out of a room so that you don't leave footprints on it? So, I got, and the people in class over here look at me like you have got to be kidding. No, for real. If you're working, if you're vacuuming a carpet, you know, and it moves the, the carpet a certain shade, in other words, it creates a trail. Okay. Um, how many, would you leave a bunch of crazy crooked lines in your room when you're vacuuming? How are they going? In my world, it's going to be straight. And I will vacuum myself out the door so that I haven't left a footprint on the pretty carpet I just made. Do I have OCD? Some people would say, oh yeah, Dr. Hamilton, you are off of the hook when it comes to being obsessive and compulsive. Yeah. Not really. Um, it, it's just the way I vacuum. Now, I vacuum at our house. Some people, well, why do I vacuum? Because I, as strange as this is going to sound, it's very relaxing for me. I'm vacuuming my straight lines. <laughs> And it works for me. Other folks, it's like, you got to be kidding. You start to say something? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's just this is the way I like to do it. So, how would you actually diagnose OCD? There are plenty of people who will say that. Sure. The, the, the number one way to get to whether or not some issue, whatever it happens to be, is a diagnosable concern is to what extent it alters one's normal function. Me vacuuming in straight lines at my house has nothing to do with me not doing something else at home. I just vacuum in straight lines. Now, if I'm worried about vacuuming in straight lines to the point that I don't bathe, that's a problem. If I worry about vacuuming in straight lines to the point that I don't care well for myself, in any other capacity, that's a problem. Um, my sister has, has cleaned houses off and on for part-time fun and for extra money for years. 
she always vacuums herself out of her room. And once, once she's done with that room, that's when she's going to vacuum and she's going to leave that room and not step back in there because she doesn't want to leave a footprint there. She is not OCD. Not at all. She just likes straight lines on her floor. Um, when it comes to diagnosing any kind of disorder, it's more about the level of dysfunction a person experiences. You know, I count things. Okay. But I, it doesn't, you know, I don't get hung up counting my steps and forget where I'm going. <laughs> you know, that sort of idea. Um, again, like you mentioned, people's um, preferences can often be misconstrued for, for something else. People's grief can be misconstrued as depression. Well, if it's lasted long enough, it probably has moved into depression. But again, that's about criteria related to uh, time. A lot of disorders are based on the amount of time you experience the difficulty. Um, the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two, for example, is about time. Same symptoms, but it's about how long have you had them. Uh, bipolar one, you have to have been manic or experienced a quote unquote manic episode that lasted at least a week. Seven days. If it lasts between four and seven days, it's bipolar two. But again, from a historical perspective, if once upon a time you had a one manic episode that was at least seven days, the next time you have a manic episode, even if it's only three days, because you, historically you've already had one, it's still going to be bipolar one disorder. Again, that's about knowing the, the criteria. Um, you ever give me an idea to what causes people to be anxious? The thought ever crossed your mind? When I give you the answer, you'll kind of chuckle and go, oh, well, yeah, that sounds reasonable. People want to be able to control stuff. They want to control exactly what's happening, which goes back to something I talked about a week or two ago when it comes to self-efficacy. Can you control your world? Now, there are some physiological issues that come up with anxiety. Some of those challenges involve different neurotransmitters or overly sensitive uh, brain stem mechanisms. You have too much of one type of neurotransmitter and not enough of another. It can be troubling. Um, people who deal with anxiety disorders may have an exaggerated sense of the danger they are encountering. They may underestimate their own coping skills, which causes anxiety. And a lot of people who deal with anxiety are also dealing with depression because they feel like they are not doing what they could as a part of their own self-control matters. Now, anxiety is also heavily linked to learning challenges. Again, I know lots of folks who deal with test anxiety. I happen to be one of them. Different types of phobias are usually related to the um, challenges of classical conditioning. Um, how many of you watch horror flicks? I don't do horror flicks anymore. It just dawned on me one day I hadn't watched a horror movie in forever. Why do you watch them? You watch them, my suspicion would be that you watch them for the rush of what's gonna happen next because you don't know. One of the most horrifying scenes for me I have ever seen in a movie theater happened when I was in the seventh grade. Most of you, even if you've seen the movie, you probably chuckle and go, what was the big deal? Jaws had just come out when I was in the seventh grade. Okay, so I'm watching in the theater, over at the Plaza Theater, actually, over in the big thriving metropolis of Vernon, Texas, with a couple of my buddies watching this crazy show. And we are as close to sitting on the edge of the seat as you can be. I mean, we were wound really tight. There's a scene, I forgot how far into the movie though. And they're out, of course, looking for the shark. And um, they're looking at a, a small rowboat of some sort, there's a hole in the bottom. And if you remember uh, the person who was in the boat, the, his head falls out of that hole and catches you very, you know, something's coming. You just don't know what. And this dead dude's head appears. It's like, oh my God. I mean, people were throwing popcorn and stuff. They scared him to death. We all jumped. It's like, oh my goodness. You know, we probably said bad words. Um, but it was like, really? If 
one of the exercises we could have done, and, I, and I've done it in class before, but I didn't do it today, is have everybody shut their eyes, in essence, and turn on some music. Well, depending on what the music is, it's going to prompt a certain type of reaction. You play the music from the original Jaws, your blood pressure is going to come up. If you've seen it before, there's something about it. It just, there's a switch that flips. We learn some of those behaviors. Things that are frightening to some people are not frightening to other people. You know, most folks now, okay, so you got rattled about a head falling out of a boat. Yeah, okay. It's, nowadays, it would be something like if you're watching the movie Megalodon and it you know, comes floating by and swallows your whole boat. That's a little different. Um, but we also get a sense of what is quote unquote real versus not. Megalodon doesn't exist anymore, supposedly. If he does, we don't know where he is. So we don't think about that being as anxiety provoking as an actual 10 or 12 foot shark. That's a little more real. And we get anxious about that kind of stuff because we have been fearful at some level. People who experience what we call rare phobias, that would be things like being afraid of snakes, fire, height, insects. Often those ideas are related to biological preparedness. Now, if you want to have some fun when it comes to talking about snakes and people's fear of them, I'm going to bring in a little bit of the Christian tradition, not because I'm proposing one or the other, but simply because of the historical information that's noted in the Bible, the Judeo-Christian religious text. Go back to the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God did these things, using that language. And if you also remember it, not too far into the book of Genesis, long about the time you get to toward chapter three, Eve, Adam and Eve, Eve is going to have a conversation with a snake. If you don't believe me, look it up. Now, first thing that always stumped me is why is this woman talking to a snake? What the heck? That makes no sense to me. When a snake starts talking, I'm out. I'm not waiting to see what else is going to take place. I am leaving if a snake starts talking to me. If the snake is standing up, please understand, if you read the text very carefully, the snake was standing up because his punishment was to crawl on his belly. So he was standing up talking to Eve. And Eve, in her right mind, we'll say, is speaking back to the snake. And they're having this conversation. Really? I'm out. I'm, I'm, if a snake is talking to me, I'm going to go see somebody about that. Now, because some people would say that because of the human creature's experience with Eve and the snake and whatnot has influenced all of humankind since then, that because of this disruptive conversation they had and all the difficulty that arose out of that, Human creatures generally are somewhat fearful of snakes. Yeah, stands to reason. But what if you're not Christian? What if that doesn't make any sense to you? What if you've never heard that story? There are probably people online who haven't heard that story before. Just pick up a just pick up a uh, an Old Testament text. Just pick up a Holy Bible and read the first three chapters of Genesis. The first three chapters of the book from the left hand side. And you'll find out all kinds of strange things that people did or didn't do, what they believed, what they didn't believe. You know, Adam and Eve having a conversation with a snake, having a conversation with God, as it were. What do all of those things mean? When we cannot process what it is we experience, we will do what's necessary to cope. I've mentioned the psychoanalytic approach before. When we encounter something that's not socially appropriate, our brains will kick into gear for us and keep us from being stupid. If we let them, we can also override them. We can override our good common sense and do something stupid anyway. All of us have done that at least once. That's just the way some of us roll. So anxiety in large, uh, by and large, is basically uh, based on our inability to control certain things related to our environment, generally speaking. 
the challenge, one of the challenges we run into is determining why it is we start to be anxious to begin with. Some of those disorders are related to earlier childhood experiences and the feeling of not feeling safe. I'm gonna quickly run through somatoform disorders and that'll get us to a place where we can stop. Somatoform disorders um, are based on one's physical body. The Greek word for body and physical is soma, which is why it's called somatoform. Those are characterized by physical symptoms that actually have no physical cause. Conversion disorder as one of those, a person appears to be, but actually is not functionally impaired. In other words, a person thinks they're blind and as, as a result of their thought about being blind, they cannot see. If there's nothing wrong with their eyes, that would be conversion disorder. Sometimes physical symptoms that they manifest for themselves will help reduce stress. And sometimes the person may not even be concerned. There's a condition called hypo, hypochondriasis, another word for a hypochondria. People make up strong fears of specific illnesses that are usually accompanied by complaints of very vague symptoms. I just don't feel well. How many folks do you know that are afraid, scared to death, they're going to have cancer? I've known lots of people who are fearful about having cancer. You know what happens? Some of those people get cancer, which is frightening. You know, did they think themselves into getting cancer? There's some information that would suggest the possibility in somatization disorder, a person makes a dramatic but vague report about the multitude of physical symptoms rather than any specific illness. Pain disorder is characterized by severe and constant pain, often with no apparent physical cause. Where does this pain come from? I don't know. I had a guy in my office last week tell me about all this stuff. He's got all kinds of physical issues. His back hurts and this hurts, that hurts. He's had all these back surgeries, yada, yada, yada. What's wrong with your back? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, the doctor told me I needed to have surgery, so I did. Okay. Did you injure your back? Not that I know of. So what did you do to it that would cause you to have such pain that prompted any kind of surgery? And on top of all that, the surgery didn't help anyway. It still hurts, right? Yep. And his only response to that was, well, I guess he was a laborer, has been a laborer all of his life. He worked in construction and whatnot. He was a day laborer actually two years younger than I am. He's 55. My body is just quit working. Has he worn it out? That's a possibility. But he can't account for some of his pain. Did he make it up? I don't know. Does he receive a certain amount of sympathy because he's uncomfortable all the time? He did display an interesting behavior when he came into my office. I wanted him to read an informed consent, which basically is an acknowledgement about what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. Now, I'm not going to talk to him about anything. I'm not going to speak with anyone about anything specific that he says, unless he says it's going to hurt himself. From I'm going to tell you about him, but it, you wouldn't be able to know who he is because I'm not going to give you identifying information about him, which is why I can speak to the, use him as an example. I'll explain to you what's on that sheet of paper if you don't want to read it. Well, my wife takes care of this stuff for me. Well, do you need to go get her? Because we're going to deal with this sheet of paper. Well, you know, and he, he wouldn't even try to read it. So I got up, went and got his wife. And I said, he concerned, he's concerned that he won't understand what the, uh, this piece of paper that I'm having him look at. She looked at me kind of quizzically, but came in the office and sat down. And I explained again what was on that sheet of paper. She never uttered a word, not one word, but she looked at him and said, sign. So it did. Now there is, that's a certain payoff for a certain type of behavior. Do y'all see the connection? He displays a, a particular type of behavior where he doesn't have to think. His wife will do that for him. Is she part of the reason he has some of his challenges? At the end of the day, yeah. It's called enabling behavior. People do it with addicts all the time. You have parents who will buy, give their children money, knowing that their children are going to go buy drugs with that money and still not cut off the money supply. 
that makes that person just as much at fault as the person who's using the drug. And there are disorders for all those kinds of things. Um, but when it comes to our bodies, uh, there's a, we're not listing all the somatoform disorders by any stretch of the imagination. There's muscle dysmorphia, uh, people and the eating disorders come underneath this particular category. Um, people look at themselves in the mirror and what they see looking back at them in the mirror is not real. An individual who is anorexic, for example, is has a misconstrued notion of what they actually look like. They, to their own eyes, they appear to be fat and overweight. So they exercise certain behaviors, one of which happens to be exercise sometimes, uh, to lessen their weight. They misperceive themselves. Um, binging and purging is a variation on that. When people would see themselves differently when they actually look in a mirror and then overeat and then go um, intentionally vomit to get rid of whatever they've eaten because they're concerned they're going to gain weight. They think they're overly fat. Muscle dysmorphia disorder typically affects more men than it does women, but it's when men look in the mirror um, and see themselves as puny and physically weak when that may or may not actually be the case. Their perception of themselves is that they have no muscles, basically. Now, those sorts of things only become problems when they interrupt a person's normal function. When you look in the mirror and say, you know what, I've gained a couple of, a couple of pounds this week. Well, you know, with, with women in general, that just might be a little bit of water weight. You know, it's a little bit of water, it'll go away. You might feel a little more puffy today or whatever word you want to use for that. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just a piece of just a day that's a little heavier than the next. No worry. So what I'm getting at is that there's all kinds of disorders, but there's just as many reasons not to get overly concerned about those sorts of things. I can diagnose all of you with something. I promise. We can, and if we, we can get close, we can make up the rest. And I can give you some information and you'll think to yourself, oh, I, I had that. No, you don't. You really don't. There are some behaviors that we all exhibit that are a little off a bit and that's okay um, but we'll quit with the somatoform disorders because we're going to start on thursday with the dissociative disorders just so you know what dissociative disorder is it's actually dissociative identity disorder it used to be known as multiple personality disorder people who have very independent very different personalities that exist in the same body. And I'll tell you about a handful of clients I've dealt with, um, one of whom had the lady I dealt with on a consistent basis. She had a 60 year old woman who was also a part of her committee, we'll say. All she wanted to do was to be angry, smoke and have sex. That person was different than my client. There was also a six year old her response to everything was to sit on the couch and to cry. She's six years old. There was another one in there um, whose name was Moon Rain. She really did wear a pair of rose colored glasses. And the only reason I know that is because they have pictures of all of them. Same person, different outfit, different hairdo, different facial expression. And if you knew how, with her anyway, you, I could, you could bring whichever one of them up you wanted to talk to. In the moment, no, but her, not, but have my client and then Maisel is the lady who was um, the angry one who wanted to drink and, and smoke and have sex all the time. Um, the, her, my client's facial expression would change. And yes, I would know which face, which face I was looking at. Yes. Um, when the little six-year-old showed up, she typically, she's come to my office before with little bitty pigtails poking out of her head. You know, she had a little bit, she had hair shorter than yours and she could make two little bitty pigtails. And if she showed up with her pigtails on, I'm dealing with the six-year-old right out of the gate. Not my client, in my client's body. Dissociative disorders are absolutely fascinating because you get to consider what it is that prompts them to develop such defense mechanisms for themselves. 
usually, not always, but usually those defense mechanisms come, come up as a result of some kind of abuse. Not always, but often. You know, another lady, when she was very, very young, her mother would put her in a suitcase and put her under the bed. Does she have issues? Yeah. You spend some time in a suitcase all folded up underneath the bed and see if you have issues. She got issues. I mean, so all kinds of things can create reasons for people to separate from themselves is what it's called. It's called splitting. Anyway, we'll talk, we'll start with dissociative identity disorders or dissociative disorders on Thursday. You need something, drop me an email or something and let me know. Otherwise, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day.